Divine Truth Information Jesus, Mary and others provide information to people and organizations who inquire about Divine Truth teachings. Jesus and Mary answer general questions asked by John Hudson from TVNZ. The information was provided on the 13th of May 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session one. <laughs> okay, John. So, AJ, was it an epiphany for you, or was it a slow uh, coming to grips with the fact that you were Jesus? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I wouldn't call it an epiphany. It was more, it, it was a more of a reluctant uh, acknowledgement that was very emotional. <laughs> I would call it. It wasn't something that I enjoyed very much at the time. Um, and in fact, it took me quite a long time to, to get used to it. Um, and, and from an emotional and psychological perspective, remembering events from the past um, in, a, in, a, in a fast succession over a long period of time um, it is quite stressful emotionally. And so, yeah, I wouldn't call it probably either, uh, actually. <laughs> there, was a, a long, there was a long succession of remembering past events from from the first century till now. Um, that's very emotional, having to acknowledge more and more and more about who you are and then wanting to go into denial about it, uh, which I wanted to do for quite some time. So uh, when I say quite some time, probably over a year or two. And, uh, but, but there were events in my childhood and throughout my life that I had remembered the past events without having any emotional significance in them. But, but once I went, started going through this process where there was emotional significance in every event, yeah, that was quite difficult and I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, really. And uh, it was, so I, I'd say, yeah, not an epiphany, but rather a long line of remembering new events from the past that I didn't remember before due to denial issues and, uh, and then having to come to accept them psychologically and emotionally. Mm. which took me some time. You'd been brought up in a, in a Christian environment. Uh, tell yes, us about uh, that. Yeah, up until I was seven years of age, my mother was an Anglican. Um, and, uh, and then when, when I was about seven, she started studying the Bible with three different other faiths, the, the Seventh-day Adventist faith and the Mormon religion and the Jehovah's Witness faith. And uh, in the end, my mother decided to become a Jehovah's Witness. So. So that, uh, when, I, when I was around nine or so, uh, that process had completed my father also. He was in the army reserves and he was a welder by trade and he eventually also became a Jehovah's Witness. So, so by the time I was 10, we were growing up in a Jehovah's Witness family. Yeah, and that continued until I was 33 years of age. Yeah, you were a pioneer with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, yeah, I used to go out knocking on doors. Uh, every Jehovah's Witness goes out knocking on doors. So uh, they, they see that as a demonstration of their faith. At the time, I didn't um, have too much comfort with it, particularly when I felt like I was encroaching upon other people's free will. But uh, because I thought it was also a part of my faith at the time, I decided to, to do that as well. So, and every Jehovah's Witness pretty much does that. Um, and you're not really considered to be a good Jehovah's Witness if you don't go from door to door. Yeah. What about preaching? Did you? Sorry, John. Sorry. Is this something you started interfering with one of the mics? Um, do you know which one? Uh, it's not. Is it rubbing on my? Yeah, it's fine. You're cool. fine. Yeah. No, it's Low battery. No. Yeah. <laughs> We're rolling. We are. Did you suddenly wake up one day and realise that you were Jesus or was it a, a slow progression? No, it was neither really, John. It was, uh, it was a series of memories that occurred over a long period of time that I eventually had to just come to terms with psychologically and emotionally. And the memories uh, range from the time that I was in the first century right the way through in my spirit world life. And, uh, and it was very difficult to go through the process and allow the process to continue. So quite frequently I went into denial about the process and as a result, you know, tried to shut down the process. And then, but the memories kept on coming and I had to keep on dealing, dealing with these new memories. And, it, and so in reality, it really took around about a year or so before I started to even personally acknowledge to myself what was really going on. 
So, um, so it was not, not really an instant uh, change and it also wasn't um, something that just occurred over a few weeks. Um, it took quite a long period of time. Um, hmm. I guess it took a lot of courage to come out as well. Well, that, that was also one of the main issues for me initially. You know, I had just, I was just starting to get my life, I felt, into good order. <laughs> um, I, I was quite se secure financially. Um, I felt quite happy with how the, the direction my life was going in at the time. Uh, when I look back at it now, I can see that I probably wasn't that happy, but that, that's what I thought at the time. And, uh, and so I, I decided to, um, I decided shortly after I came to awareness that all these memories could only mean one thing, um, I started to go into quite a lot of fear about, you know, what that was going to mean for my life and, uh, and what kind of damage that might do to my life and, and so forth. So, yeah, I became quite worried about that for periods of time and that's one of the reasons why I shut down the process quite a lot. And, uh, and then every time I shut down the process, uh, I felt much worse so, so than I was feeling when I was allowing the process. So, <laughs> so in the end, I just allowed the process to continue. Um, and I don't know if you could call it courageous <laughs> because it was just a, uh, there, there was, I didn't really feel at the time there was much choice <laughs> to, to shut down the process meant that I, I felt like I was shutting myself down quite significantly. And so I had to just allow the process and, and allow whatever was going to come to come. That, that didn't mean, though, that I disclosed to anyone during those periods of time um, who, who I was. And in fact, um, it took me some, quite some months, nearly nine months, before I disclosed to my sons, they were the first people I talked to about the issue, um, that I'd been going through this experience for the past nine months. And, uh, and, and they were the first persons I mentioned to that I, that I was going through this process of remembering who I am. And what was their reaction? Well, um, both of them know me pretty well. So we, we have a really good relationship uh, with both Caleb. I have a good relationship with both Caleb and Tristan. So um, they, and they trusted me, they trust my experience and they know I'm not a crazy or an idiot or any of those kind of things. They also know that I'm not seeking any power or glory or any of those kind of things. So. Probably the best way to put it was their response was circumspect. Uh, they didn't. Uh, my my oldest son felt like, oh, yeah, it might be true even, you know, like that was his feeling. Uh, my younger son felt very similarly. And so, um, yeah, they weren't too concerned for me or anything like that. What did their mother think? Um, I don't know if they told their mother... Um, uh, for, for, for years after that. I'm not sure when they disclosed to their mother. So you weren't living with her at the time? Or? No, no. Um, we'd, we'd broken up uh, about seven years prior and, uh, and I was living by myself at this stage. So, yeah, we, we, and, and because of her fear of, fear of me, she has quite a lot of fear of anyone who speaks the truth generally, um, she, she finds it difficult to speak to me directly, so, so, so I couldn't disclose it to her. And I'm not sure when my boys actually disclosed anything to their mother about about who I was saying I was at the time. And they're still close to you? They, they accept who you are? Yeah, my son Tristan. Um, you, you might have actually seen him in the audience yesterday. Um, yeah, we, we, we spend quite a bit of time together and enjoy each other's company a, a lot. And my son Caleb, he lives in Hobart in Tasmania and he, he's a musician and loves doing what he does. And we get to talk fairly frequently. We're not like in each other's pockets, I would, I would say, but we, we enjoy getting together and having fun together. And uh, anyone who comments on us being together generally is, uh, they're pretty much, um, yeah, they, m most people can see that we're basically like brothers. Yeah. So let's talk about your, your childhood yourself. Mm -hmm. you, you were brought up in a Christian family, I understand. Yes, yeah, so I was brought up, uh, my mother was Anglican in the Anglican faith until I was seven years of age. And so, when I was around, I can remember going to Sunday school a few times and things like that, going to the church. Um, there's a few sort of memories like that about those things. And then when I was seven, around about, my mother started studying the Bible with three different faiths, uh, with the Mormon, Jehovah's Witness and the Seventh-day Adventist faith. And in the end, she decided that she was going to become a Jehovah's Witness. And at the time, I think she was the second only Jehovah's Witness in, in our town. <laughs> And so um, in the Riverland town in which we were growing up in South Australia. And so um, 
By the time my father became a Jehovah's Witness, which was a few years later, uh, I was around nine years of age or so, and and uh, and by the time I was ten, obviously both my parents were in the in the faith, in the Jehovah's Witness faith, and the, and I stayed in that until I was thirty three years of age. Yeah. So a lot of your skills, I guess, you would have. Um gain from, from talking about Jesus uh, on the road, knocking on doors and what have you, yeah? Not really, um, because a lot of the skills that you learn as a Jehovah's Witness are more, uh, they're very formal skills, I suppose you would say. So while um, I was brought up in such a way that I would get up on a platform and speak, even when I was eight or nine years of age, and in fact I started when I was seven, as soon as mum took me to the to the uh, church or the congregation, usually sh shortly after that I started reading out the Bible in front of people and things like that. So I was used to being in front of people, but I was always quite nervous about it. Um, so I wouldn't say that I was really comfortable with it at any point in time in that entire time that I was a part of the faith. Um, but yes, yeah, so eventually, you know, we, I spoke to people who were... Just at that point? Just right then. Okay. Moving on. Yeah, this is the problem last time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So is that back here? Maybe it's overheating or something. Anyway. Did it happen we... on the weekend? No. 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 Last night when we were playing down some stuff onto a recorder that we, so we could send the yeah. stuff back to uh, New Zealand. It just came yeah. Back. Very sorry about that. Is that all right? Uh, okay. Well, and do you need power? Rather yeah, than... I was going to say, would that no. help? Mm. No. No, I don't think so. Okay, John. Right. <laughs> the question now. <laughs> what were you right. saying? Well, you were. Well, let's pick it up with the. You're a Jehovah's Witness, and you had been uh, doing some uh, pioneer Skills. work and preaching. Oh, and yeah, that's bit. right. Yeah. Yes. So, so yes, we would go knocking on doors from door to door. That every Jehovah's Witness does that, actually. And uh, and then, of course, uh, as I became eventually an elder in the faith. So, so that meant that I was on the platform in the local congregation regularly, and eventually, I got to speak with larger audience of three to five thousand people generally. So. Um, so that was, a, I suppose you could say, a little bit of practice, but nothing like what I used to do in the first century or what I've done in the spirit world or, or what I now do. Um, and in fact, during that period of time, whenever I got up on a platform, I was usually quite nervous and stressed out. And also, um, we had to present material that was a certain, certain set material that was set beforehand that other people had written. and. Uh, and so you're not always comfortable with the material that, you, that you're sharing with others, and so that creates a degree of nervousness as well. And were you an elder in the Jehovah's Witness Church when you started realising, started having these memories? No, um, I started having some memories when I was there, but um, I didn't ever assign them to what, what the later periods of time I, I started realising they were all about. So I started having feelings and memories about all sorts of events, uh, some, some torture-based events and so forth, but, but I never really thought that they had anything to do with anything other than something that maybe happened in my childhood that I'd blocked out or something like that. And uh, it took me some time uh, after I left the faith, even it took me another seven years uh, after I left the faith before I began having those kind of experiences. Why did you leave? Well, there was a number of reasons why I left. The first reason was that I had fell out of love with my wife and, and I knew that she had fell out of love with me many years prior, about seven years prior to my falling out of love with her. And then I felt very uncomfortable uh, with what I knew the Bible to say about you must love your wife as your own self. And, and I, I knew I could not love her as my own self anymore. I could love her as a, as a person, but, but not not in that way that the Bible was describing. And so, I, so I, I, I came up with this sort of conundrum that I was faced with. And that was, I'm not in love with her now, but I'm living with her. I can't make love to her anymore. And it's wrong to, felt wrong to be with her, but the Bible was saying that I should stay with her. But on the other hand, the Bible was saying that if I was going to stay with her, I had to love her. So, so I had a lot of difficulty with that and, and eventually the difficulties so, uh, from an emotional and ethical point of view became too great and, and, and I decided that I had to leave her and, uh, and so I did that 
when I was around 33 years mm. old. Yeah. What was the reaction to from your parents when you told them that you were Jesus? Um, my my mother, in the discussion I had with her, seemed quite okay with it, but actually. Um, she became quite distressed about what I might do to myself, was the, her, her primary prob problem with it, and which in, illustrates how little she knows me in a, in a lot of ways, because I, I would never do anything to harm myself. And, the, and so she, 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 in the discussion was fine, but then she went away, and then after a while she discussed it with some of our family, you know, some of the other members of the family, I think my, one of my uncles and, and aunties, and and then she decided that the best possible thing would be go and see a psychologist about it. So she did that. And the psychologist then had to report it because he felt I would be a danger to myself. And so then I had to get assessed by, by a doctor who, because I, I was actually getting uh, some insurance for my business at the time and they wouldn't give me more insurance without getting an assessment. And then when I went in for the assessment, I, I, for the first time I read the report that my mother had written uh, about you know, she was concerned. That she was concerned. That was the first time I knew about it, which mm. was actually about a year after I'd told her. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's face it, um, quite a few people have thought they were Jesus, and quite a few of them are in psychiatric hospitals. Oh, I agree. Yeah. yeah. What makes you different? Well, I think anybody who speaks with me can see that I, I don't seem to be psychologically disturbed. Uh, anybody who knows me personally knows that I don't have a messiah complex, as is claimed, and anybody who... Uh, speaks and lives with me, even Mary who lives with me, knows that I'm pretty sane. So, um, and in fact, when I went with the doctors to have the assessment, that, that, that was their opinion. And in fact, I invited one of the doctors to come and live with me for a, for a month to see whether I was sane or not. <laughs> of course, most people who are insane um, can't hold together their life. And that's very different to what, what it is for me. I hold together everything in my life. So. Yeah. You don't see yourself... So, I'm leaning, am I? Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm leaning to the left. You don't... I don't hear you calling yourself Jesus Christ. Um, what's the difference? Well, when a person is Christed, they are... It, it's a process that you go through with God when you become at one with God. So my current condition is not such that I am and now at one with God in terms of how I do everything. And I hope that my future condition will be such. And once that happens, then I'll be Jesus Christ again. But at the moment, I'm just Jesus of Nazareth, the guy that was born by Mary and Joseph in the first century. And, uh, and I've... Mr. 2000, you lie. Stop. Right at that point. <laughs> oh, I can't believe this. So you don't call yourself Jesus Christ. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that uh, when a person is Christed, they are in a condition of being at one with God, and I'm not yet in that condition again. And I hope to be in that condition at some point in the future if I continue progressing like I'm progressing. But um, I am just at the moment the same, the same Jesus that was born of Nazareth, of born of Joseph and Mary in the first century. And uh, I've had a 2,000-year life, but, but the reality is that I'm going through a process right now. And, and that process is incomplete. And, and it's a process that I'm recommending other people also undertake. And in the end, there, once you become at one with God, you are all then Christed, if you like. You, you now have God's love in you to the point where you are now in complete harmony with God with everything that you do in terms of a loving, from a loving perspective. And at that point, you could be said to be Christed. And I suppose in a secondary sense, Christ also refers to the term Messiah. And in the first century, I did claim to be the Messiah, even though I was rejected by the Jews as being the Messiah. And, uh, and that's the Greek word Christ refers to being uh, the Messiah, if you like. And so I, my viewpoint of being the Messiah is very different to what other people view of being the Messiah. So. Uh, but it, and again, my father in the first century thought being the Messiah meant with I'd be the king of the Jews and the king of the world eventually, and I knew that that would never be the case. Mm. Well, we went to church yesterday and uh, just to check up with, uh, with the Christians about what they perceive as being the second coming you know, yeah. and, and how the Bible refers to that. And of course, there's Matthew 24, which talks about uh, 
lightning from the east to the west and the, and the sun going dim and the moon going dim and the stars falling from the sky and, yes. and Jesus descending to, to earth um, in all his glory, mm -hmm. which is a little And also would then destroy the wicked at the same that's time. That's right, all of that. <laughs> and, and that's a little different from, from what I've seen down the road in Mergen. Uh, <laughs> okay. So how do we reconcile that? Well, firstly, um, the Bible is just an in incorrect on these particular subjects, as it is incorrect on many subjects. It's incorrect about God and God's nature. It's incorrect about my nature. It doesn't. It's, it's incorrectly reflected my life in the first century. I have an advantage over many people when I read the Bible, and that is, it it quotes my life, <laughs> and so therefore I uh, I feel quite able to <laughs> state that no, those particular things didn't necessarily happen in my life. And there are quite a number of things the Bible say, says that didn't happen in my life. And there's also quite a number of things the Bible says about my personality and nature that are not true. And one of those things is, is that it says that I, I'm going to come as the instrument of God to destroy the wicked. And that's certainly not true. And if that's not true, then there's, there's certainly the possibility that other things in the Bible are not true. So I would suggest to any Christian that they reevaluate these things based on love rather than sort of trusting a book that has been highly modified over a long period of time to, to suit the teachings of men rather than being the actual truth of God. And if they did that, I feel that they would have a great ability to be able to determine through love what is accurate and what ha is not accurate. And, and I feel it, that's the more important thing, is actually looking from a position of love and asking yourself, would the Jesus of love, who, who said in the first century, actually, as quoted in the Bible in Matthew 7, who said he wouldn't, you know, that your very enemy you must love, and if you don't love your enemy, then you're no better than a tax collector, would he then come and destroy his enemies if he loved them? And obviously there's some inconsistency there, I would suggest. Mm. And, and my feelings are if people want to believe in those particular things, I'm okay with them believing in them. I'm just stating that they're not God's truth. And, uh, and they, although they are free to have their own belief systems, they will find sooner or later that they were wrong when it comes to Jesus' personality. Can we go through some of the events of the first century? Sure you can. Um, yeah. The virgin birth. No, True. no, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. No. My mother and father had sex and they had me. <laughs> and it happened pretty shortly after they were married. Yeah. Okay. The crucifixion, why? Uh, mostly uh, there was no purpose to it. Uh, I know the Christians claim that the purpose was a sacrifice to, uh, to appease a God of wrath to take away the sin of the world. That's not the case at all. The only reason for my death was that I w was stirring up the political and religious structure of the time through my commentary about, about love and love was confronting, the, the attitudes of love were confronting what they were doing at the time. So, so eventually they could see that if, if, I was con if, I were, if I continued to do what I was doing, that, that, and so many people were starting to listen to me about it, that sooner or later the faith would be destroyed, the Jewish faith would be destroyed. So, so the Jewish Sanhedrin, of which my own father was a member, decided, and not unanimously, <laughs> To, to take some action against me, to get rid of me. Now, initially, they decided to send, you know, Pharisees to me to criticise my teachings, and that didn't work. And then they started to send assassins, and they uh, had a few times where, when I was stabbed and uh, a few other things, which are not recorded in the Bible. And then, and then of course, they decided to, no, they'd had enough, and that was enough now, and they decided to just have a night sitting of the Sanhedrin where most of the members who were dissenters of their decision weren't present and, uh, and decide to condemn me and then send me to Pilate to, to be crucified. Were you celibate? No, no, not at all. And I was celibate up until, uh, up until my one went with God and even a bit further beyond that point. And so I was over 30 years of age before I had a relationship with a woman. The only woman that I had a relationship with in the first century was Mary. And I met her around six months or so into my public ministry, as it's referred to nowadays. Um, so, yeah, and we established a relationship um, after that. We, we didn't start a relationship straight away, but about a year and a half after that, we started a relationship and, and we married. Did you have children? Um, we, Mary was pregnant with our daughter um, when, when I died. So 
um, but we didn't have any other children. So Dan Brown was right. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Not on everything. <laughs> no. no. So well, what... and I think it's pretty obvious if you even look at the Bible that there was a special relationship between myself and Mary Magdalene. Um, it's just that the, the, there were many reasons why certain disciples covered that over. Some of them did so to protect Mary at the time to ch and protect my child at the time. And others did so because they hated Mary. Uh, and ones like Peter hated Mary. And so, you know, they wanted to get rid of the whole idea that Mary was in my life. So there, there were often uh, a lot of disharmony, if you like, between the subsequent followers of Christ, as, as it said now, and their opinions about whether Mary should have been accepted as my wife or not. Yeah. Judas Iscariot, was he a, the traitor that we're all... Uh supposed to believe that he was or not? No. He was a man who, he was constantly trying to put me into conflicting situations with Pharisees because he, he felt that if I was forced into conflicting situations with Pharisees, that I'd eventually prove my power to them and eventually they'd accept me as the Messiah. So, and I kept talking to him about it, that that wasn't going to work, but he didn't believe me. And just as many of my disciples, when I married Mary, they all thought it was a bad idea. Right? So they were frequently telling me I had bad ideas in the first century. And as a result of that, uh, he decided on his own back to, to try and confront, create a confrontation. So he, he basically uh, falsified his own feelings towards me with the Pharisees in order to get some kind of confrontation to occur, which he thought that I would extricate myself from. So, and then thereby proving my power to them. Did you know he was doing that? I only knew on the day. I was told by my, some of my spirit friends, uh, in particular John the Baptist, who had passed, and I could talk to spirits quite easily. So John the Baptist came to me and told me that it was happening on the day that it was happening. I knew that it was a potential occurrence because for, for quite a few months beforehand, he was constantly trying to put me in these sticky situations with Pharisees and Sadducees who were members of the Sanhedrin. So um, I knew that, 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 it, that it probably wasn't going to end up very well. And Mary and I had discussed the fact that uh, there was a potential of me dying from, from, from the actions of my own disciples, actually. Mm. Yeah. So what was your mission in the first century? Why did you come to earth? I come to teach the truth about God and the truth about having a relationship with God that every single person on this planet can have an individual relationship with God without a mediator between themselves and God. God wants to have a relationship with every one of God's children. And as a result, God is always wanting these relationships with his children. So, so I come to teach how to have the relationship with God and what, what kind of benefits this relationship can establish. And so in the first century, I realized that I had to first have this relationship with God myself. So the reason why there's no record or very little record of me before I was 30 years of age in a public setting is because I spent most of that time in privacy working my way through the emotional issues that I needed to work my way through in order to have and establish this relationship with God to the point where I knew I had become at one with God. And once I had become at one with God, then I started to teach uh, in more public fashion. Before then I did teach, very similarly to how I'm doing now. I, I taught, you know, small groups of people, up to a few hundred people at a time, uh, for, for my whole twenties, all through my twenties in the first century. But none of that was recorded, uh, because it was very hard to write about such things anyway. Most of the people who I was teaching did not know how to write anyway. And so they, it was all word of mouth type uh, things that got transmitted uh, uh, during that time. But uh, yeah, the reality is that I started teaching around 25 years of age, but for the first five or six years, I wasn't at one with God, and I did not perform any miracles or any of those kind of things that would cause people to stand up and listen. And those people who did listen to me listened because the truth sort of tugged at their heart. And then when I became at one with God, this was a quite an obvious shift in, in myself in terms of my happiness and, and in terms of my ability to give more knowledge. And as a result of that, larger groups of people became attracted to listening to, to the divine truth at the time. Yeah. We, we read in the Bible about miracles. Mm -hmm. Did they all happen? 
Not them all. Some happened and others did not. So I can go through each one if you like. <laughs> let's, do a, let's do a few. Breaking of the, the loaves and the fishes, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that didn't happen. No. Um, I, I'm, I was a vegetarian at the time and, I, and so I didn't eat fish uh, at the time. And, uh, and in fact, I became a vegetarian when I was 13 years of age uh, when my father, or 12 in, if you looked at today's terminology, um, I became, uh, I went to Jerusalem for the first time when I was 12 years of age in the first century. And uh, I saw the rivers of blood, if you like, from the sacrifices of the Jews and, and the way the, te the temple stank like a, like a piggery. And, uh, and as a result, I was very much turned off eating meat under any circumstances after that time. And so I stopped eating meat from that point in time onwards. And, and yeah, it, it is physically impossible to, to do such multiplication <laughs> as, as, uh, as the loaves and the fishes would suggest. The, these kind of things were stated to make me comparable with other prophets who, had, who, who were Eastern, in Eastern philosophies and Eastern religions who were said to have made food or created food out of their own hands and so forth. So water into wine would have been out as well. Yes, water into wine was out too. I, um, that all came from an um, experience that I had where I did attend the wedding and uh, it was a wedding of my brother, uh, one of my brothers, James. And as a result of the, the wedding, there was a bit of conflict at the wedding and, uh, and um, I finished up buying them some wine um, in, in the wedding because they'd run out of wine. Uh, that I gave them to as a part of the celebration, and uh, and for some reason that was turned into this water into wine thing. But again, that was another comparison with a with a Hindu god that could do such a thing. So, and there were also some Grecian and Roman gods who could turn water into wine as well. So these were all things that were said to be a comparison of those particular things. So what? Sorry. sorry. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> You're all right, then, chef. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. What miracles did happen then? Well, all the miracles that refer to the healing of people all happened. And the miracles of the so-called raising from the dead happened, but not in the manner that people assume them to have happened. There is a state uh, when, you, when, the, when the physical body dies, it goes through a state which uh, most people are, are aware of nowadays medically. And that is, it's a state where you don't have a heartbeat, you don't seem to have any brain activity, but your spirit body is still connected to your physical body. And this occurs quite frequently on earth even now. And during that time, you can resuscitate the physical body, you can restart the physical body, and, there, and it's like resurrecting the person from the dead, if you like. And if you think about it, a lot of medical professionals do that every day, right? In terms of resuscitating people. And that is possible. It is not possible to resurrect the person from the dead if the spirit body has severed what's called the silver cord between the spirit body and the material body. And so uh, under no circumstances, if the silver cord had severed, can anybody resurrect anybody from the dead. So Lazarus wasn't brain dead? No, he was not brain dead. He was sort of in a space of what you would call suspended a coma or a suspended kind of animation. Um, I knew they had buried him alive. Uh, I knew that his spirit body was still attached to his physical body, so I knew that he could be resuscitated. And my only reason why I cried during that stage was because, which is recorded in the Bible, is because I felt quite sad that the fact that my friend had been buried alive, and uh, and did not, and that people generally did not know even the process of death, what actually occurred during the process of death. Now, Mary, you were the first person to see Jesus after the resurrection, according to the Bible. Is that the, yes. is that the way it happened? Yep, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to visit the tomb. Obviously, I was grief-stricken, um, as AJ's just told you, that we were married and um, I was pregnant. And it was quite a uh, traumatic event for me, you know, this death, that even though we knew that it might happen, as it was occurring, I was I was very upset and sad, and and um, I wanted to go and be near him. And um, I arrived there, and suddenly there was this other man who I didn't recognise initially. Uh, just as I think that's recorded in the Bible, um, because he did appear physically different. Um, uh, but once I saw him and made eye contact with him, and um, we spoke, I knew certainly that it was my husband. And um, yeah, that was a very beautiful experience, really, for me. 
to recognise as well. I suppose for a lot of that time when Jesus was teaching us and, and I was his student as much as I was his wife, um, he spoke a lot about the fact that life doesn't end once once your physical body dies and his appearing, oh, his reappearing or being back there was proof. It, it was a very faith building experience. I, I saw, I knew, I had evidence that yeah, wow, uh, my husband wasn't lost to me. He, he had just passed from the physical world and I could still have a relationship with him. Do you mm. still have feelings of grief about what happened at that time? Certainly, John. I have a lot, yeah. Because um, as Jesus was just pointing out to you, as he or AJ Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> not to be confusing, but um, he went through a long process of many years of remembering things and allowing the emotions associated with them. And as he did that, that, that enabled him to know who he was. Um, and I'm still going through a lot of that process. I have a lot of memories that are still not, um, I feel sure about who I am, but there's a lot of grief that needs to leave me still about those experiences. Mm. So did you have a slow uh, realisation or was it an epiphany for you, did you that you were Mary of the first century? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, my story is a little different in that I had no preconceived notion about Mary Magdalene. Um, uh, I suppose I'd probably heard various things um, through my, my grandmother was a Catholic and I'd been to church with her a few times and uh, I don't have any strong vivid recollection of Mary Magdalene being mentioned but I suppose there's a lot of f uh, historical folklore biblical reference that I may have imbibed somewhere. Jesus Christ superstar you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well there's that yes yeah. and um, and I probably read the Da Vinci Code as well and um, so I didn't have any idea about this Mary Magdalene uh, person. And Until you met AJ or, or did it happen before that? Well, I would say still I don't have very good idea about this Mary Magdalene that's depicted everywhere. I, I don't feel like I'm fitting a mould of, of um, a story. I feel I'm experiencing my memories that are becoming uh, a story of the truth about who Mary Magdalene is. Um, and I didn't have, to answer your question more directly, I didn't have an epiphany. I began to have a series... Similar to AJ, I had some emotional experiences in my adolescence that were unexplainable to me. Um, huge episode of deep grief that I couldn't associate with anything that had happened uh, in the 15 years prior <laughs> that I had uh, conscious memory of. Uh, and a few other things had happened to me over the years, but I just filed them in the I don't understand uh, file. And when I met AJ, um, he was saying that he was Jesus, and I was pretty dubious actually. <laughs> I thought he was a nice bloke, and uh, I loved, and I actually had a sort of an inexplicable uh, response to what he was teaching. I sort of felt it was true and it brought up different emotions but I seemed to sort of understand it fairly quickly, quicker than say my parents who'd gone to various lectures of his and and so forth. Um, and then uh, I happened to find out, not from him, that he, he had feelings that I was Mary Magdalene and even at that point I was still pretty dubious. Um, but certain things transpired and we ended up starting a relationship. Um, well, a friendship, I think we'd have to call it at that mm. point. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a romantic relationship. And I sort of had this feeling that I was going to convince this guy that, you know, this is great what you're teaching, but really you've got to give up this Jesus thing because no one's going to listen to you. Um, but as things developed and we became closer, I still had that feeling. But then, um, again, with no explainable reason, I, I one morning, not in the presence of AJ, I began to have this deep grief experience that I, I suddenly remembered certain things about, not about the crucifixion, but about having a husband who passed. And um, I suppose uh, I feel that the figures of Jesus and Mary Magdalene are very um, depicted in certain ways in different um, popular culture now and in religious stories and things like that. But I don't really have a strong sense of 
matching that, I just am experiencing a group of memories that are telling me that I, that I am her and that I um, had this life with this person who taught about God and we travelled together and that we were very close and then he was killed. And I also remember um, my life before that point. I have quite strong, vivid memories of a childhood growing up and various um, things happening to me, both happy and quite traumatic. And then the life that I had after he passed, which extended another 30 years or so. Um, and I feel that I'm still coming to terms psychologically with what all that means, <laughs> that, that that means that I'm Mary Magdalene. But certainly the evidence that I have is that this is who I am and I can't really deny that anymore. I have tried to many times. <laughs> So how does the Mary Magdalene that you remember now differ from the portrayal in the Bible? Go on again. It's these questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs>
and um, there wasn't many other men who were brave enough to be there because mm, they were okay. fearful, mm. fearful for their life, yeah. um, their lives. But yep, I was there, and it was very. Um, I suppose if you can imagine what it would be like to have your husband killed in front of you, that's that's how traumatic it was for me, and um, certainly it didn't have um, any kind of. Uh, mystical, magical, religious significance to us. It was it was a traumatic event um, for all of us. We were losing. For myself, I was losing the person I loved the most in all the world, and it was a very torturous death as well. Were you there at the ascension? <laughs> well. Was there an ascension? Yeah, I, that's, I think you'd have to define what you mean by ascension. Well, the me. Bible talks about Jesus kind of uh, flying off into the clouds like a helicopter. <laughs> um, that's my impression of what the Bible says. You, yeah. you, you correct me on this. Well, um, I have no memory of that, no. Mm. And um, no, I don't, I, perhaps you want to answer <laughs> whether you flew into the clouds <laughs> like a helicopter, but no, that's not mm. what happened. No. Well, the Nicene Creed, for example, says he ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the mm -hmm. Father Almighty. Yeah. You know. mm. Which is, is that? Do you true. accept that? No. no. Well, so what happened? Well, uh, um, as soon as I died, as soon as you die, you, you separate from your physical body. You, your spirit body is still present and your soul is connected to your spirit body. So as soon as I died, that's what happened. I knew that would happen. I'd seen that happen many times before. And so... Uh, with every single death, this is the reason why I could sense when a person was, you know, connected to their body still, because I could sense when a person had broken that connection. So I knew that was going to happen with my own death. And once I became a spirit, uh, the first thing that I did is I watched Mary and the others grieving and, and them picking up my body. They took it to a, to a tomb. They uh, anointed it basically and wrapped it as was the custom and uh, placed me in the tomb and sealed the door off. And then the Sanhedrin put two guards at the front of my tomb, which was actually a tomb that my father had bought. So they knew where the tomb was because my father was a member of the Sanhedrin at the time. So um, the, the Bible account says that it was Joseph of Arimathea or something that, that, uh, that was, who, who owned the tomb, but it was actually my father. So. The, the tomb, I was placed in the tomb and, and once the, the disciples went, I, I've, the first thing that I did was visit, um, they, they, they eventually all went to sleep <laughs> um, after a lot of grieving. Um, and the first thing I did after I left the earth was visited the hells. I went through the different parts of the spirit world that were the hells. And all I did was basically declared to people that they had, they had this availability of God's love now. Um, being, being given to them, no matter what condition they were in. So they could be in the hells or in the heavens, it didn't matter. And there are very many different heavens in the spirit world. At this time, there, was, there, there were around nine different heavens in the spirit world and that had been created. And, uh, and now there's much more than that. But um, at that time, um, I visited all of those locations, uh, d talking to people about the fact that divine love was now available. Then, uh, as soon as uh, Mary started, woke up again uh, and, and ran to the tomb, then I wanted to be there, obviously, and meet her, and her, she being my most precious, <laughs> most precious love. <laughs> and so I appeared to her. Um, all I did then was materialise a body. And I was trying to also illustrate to her that she could feel my soul. Uh, I didn't need to have the same look. Um, all she needed to do was feel my soul, and she could feel me. And, uh, and so, so we did that and Mary recognised me and of course uh, we talked a bit, we talked quite, quite a lot actually uh, for quite a few hours, the Bible doesn't say that, but then Mary ran back and talked to the others about it and of course none of the men believed her. Um, by this stage um, I had also, uh, uh, there's a law that you, you can engage in the spirit world to speed up the decay of a body or, or any substance actually. And so I had decayed my own body so that people could not get too confused about the fact that, that I was still alive. If, my, if they still saw my body there, they might think differently. So, so what I did is decayed my own body 
to prove that uh, that no that person was now gone the, the the body of that person was now gone but here I am I'm still here and uh, and then I appeared to many people after that for 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 nearly the next 50 days or so I appeared to many people until they actually through had worked through enough grief to actually engage my teachings and actually receive some of God's love themselves and that's what I called the gift of the Holy Spirit to them and I and I, I promised them that that would happen sometime after my passing, um, but uh, but eventually it happened 50 days after my passing, and so I uh, decided then that they didn't need me as much anymore on, on earth, and instead uh, I spent a lot of time with Mary after that point, and uh, and spent a lot of time uh, I became the guardian, if you like, the spirit guardian of our daughter, Sarah, when she was born. And so I spent a lot of my time on earth uh, after my passing uh, with, with, with Mary and Sarah and also helping all of the people who were involved in teaching the truth, the divine truth at the time. And, uh, and uh, then, of course, as Mary passed, I welcomed her into the spirit world and got it, did an orientation course, I suppose you could call it, <laughs> uh, which is what normally happens to me. So do you have ancestors alive today then? No. What happened was our, our Sarah, uh, daughter Sarah married. She married Luke, who is the Bible writer, Luke. But, uh, but uh, when the children were not, the, the children were, the oldest child was just in, in her teens. And the young, we had three grandchildren. Um, they, the Roman soldiers found out where Mary, Mary was still alive and the children lived and the grandchildren lived. And they, the, Luke and Sarah heard about that and they decided to leave and Mary decided to stay. And Mary at that point in time was tortured to death. And then about probably a month after, um, Luke and Sarah were found in a ship near Rome in, in Italy. And, uh, and they were also uh, slaughtered at that point in time. And the only person who survived was Sarah because they thought that, their Luke, that Luke's oldest daughter was Sarah. And so they thought they'd killed everybody. And Sarah uh, had a period of time when she went sort of almost crazy. Um, and then she recovered from that and she went back to France. And she died an old lady, but she didn't have any more children. So no, there's no, there's no people on earth who would be able to claim that they're yeah. a part of the bloodline of Jesus or Mary. Mary, do you remember being tortured to death? Yeah, yeah, I do. You've had a hard time. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not a very nice thing to remember, and I, um, I suppose I still ha uh, resist a lot of those feelings. They're very, uh, the events are quite clear to me, and uh, but just at the moment, I'm working through a lot of the fear and um, grief that I have about that time. Yeah, but I remember it quite clearly what happened and um, but that's only come as a process of me being more willing to be open to my emotions as time has gone by. How is it that you've both appeared in rural Queensland at the same time? Not only you two but there's also other people who believe that they were um, characters from from your life in the first century as well. How, how does this happen? How does this work? So what do you think is, uh, uh, is unusual about it, that we're in rural Queensland or that we're Not here so at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, the sceptics watching this will, sure. we will be going, yeah, well, we might be able to accept that, that Jesus can reincarnate, and it says so in the Bible, you know, the second coming, etc., etc. But for Mary to suddenly turn up as well, as well as a, whole, a bunch of other characters, all in a little place in, in Queensland, I mean, what's this all about? You know? Well, I mean, obviously, well, perhaps it's not obvious oh, to I your think viewers. Firstly, but... we need to probably clarify some things. Um, firstly, there is not, it's not reincarnation in the standard way that people view reincarnation. So, so reincarnation is probably not the right word for it because what people believe on earth to be reincarnation actually doesn't happen. And, uh, and there are many reasons why they believe it happens, which can all be explained. But uh, so I, I don't know if reincarnation is the right word so for it. So not the Buddhist philosophy of reincarnation? No, certainly no. not. How would you no. describe what's happening here then? It's a, a connection between our soul, which is in a unified state, in a union state, 
in a dimension that exists uh, in, in what you would call space, I suppose, and, but it's also it's a, it's a dimensional existence, it's not the physical dimension. And it connected to two bodies that were created by our parents having a child. And we, we decided to connect to those bodies and live a certain part of our life on Earth uh, as a normal, what seems to be a normal person. We chose that for a lot of reasons. The primary reason is that we felt if we just appeared that everyone would think that we're some kind of angel or God or, you know, as they already do, think that Jesus is God and that would just worsen the situation. What we wanted to do was prove through our actions that, that myself and Mary and others were, weren't angels as in the, in the common sense and we weren't, and I was not God, we were just human and we wanted to prove that to people in the modern age. So, so that's the reason why we returned in that fashion. We could have returned in other ways, but we decided to return by actually connecting to a, a, a child and that child growing until it had some memories. But there's a whole group of you, isn't there, that have returned? It's not just you, there's, yeah, there's, there's seven other, 14, 14, seven couples, yeah. Yeah. soulmates. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so why? Um, to demonstrate. Yeah. You go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To demonstrate these truths that we spend a lot of time speaking about, we hope to also demonstrate the power of receiving God's love to the point of at one moment, and then to return to this state of being um, completely in harmony with or at one with your soulmate again. So it's not an accident that soulmates have come back. In fact, there's a limitation that we, it's impossible we, to come back without it being soulmates. Yes, mm -hmm. without us being pairs, if you like. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's a lot of um, belief that Jesus is the only one who can attain that state uh, or, or that Jesus is God. So having a group of us return is a way of demonstrating that it's not just one person who can have this special relationship with God, but, but many of us. All of us, in fact. So you're the children of God, but not the Son, the Holy Spirit and God and the Trinity. Certainly exactly. not, yeah. yeah. And also, just to clarify, uh, we're not all in rural Queensland. Um, uh, AJ himself didn't grow up near here. I'm mm. the only one who has. Um, there are another couple of the 14, a couple of the 14, yep, here in Australia. But then the others are all around the world, in Canada, in... Um, in the USA, oh, Asia, they were Asia. born in Asia and in Africa. And Africa. So yeah. how did you find each other then? <laughs> well, well, I would argue that they still hasn't found themselves. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, speaking about them in some ways would just put more pressure on them. Yeah. And, I, and I sort of feel like they, they will eventually know who they are in the sense that they will have to go through the same process that we've had to go through. And, but it's a process they need to choose. Like they can choose to not do it as well. Now, some of them have chosen to do it, some of them haven't, and some of them haven't even got any awareness at this point of, as to who they are. Just like we, when, when I was earlier than 33 years of age, I did not have any awareness either. And Mary, younger than 30, did not have any awareness either. So mm -hmm. um, we had experiences, and they've all had experiences as well. But they've never really tried to resolve them psychologically or otherwise. And so my feelings are that it may happen or it may not happen. We, sent, we, we decided to have seven of us come so that if some of us didn't do it, <laughs> that at least some of us may succeed. Um, and we knew that it was a choice. We knew that each of us needed to make a personal choice if we were going to do it. And, and so that, that's what's really happening right now. How did you find each other then? This time now? Yeah, this time. Yeah. Who found it? Well, how did it work? Um, the same way it happened in the first century, actually. <laughs> Not quite the same, but similar. similar yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, AJ is not from this area, but I grew up local, uh, to, not so far, uh, within an hour of where we are right now. Um, but as I mentioned to you earlier, I've been, I've travelled the world quite a bit and I've lived overseas for about five years before I met AJ. Um, and it, it just happened that I flew back in to the country and I was staying with my parents. Um, and within two days, they said, look, we've been listening to this guy who's a spiritual teacher and we don't know about it. And he reckons he's Jesus and yeah, it might be right, it might be right, but I don't know. That's probably my dad's take on it. And my mum was a little more uh, reserved about it. 
Um, but look, we're interested for you to, to listen and he's coming in a couple of days if you want to listen. So there I was in my parents' lounge room and AJ came in and gave a talk about um, God and emotions and all these things that I, as I said earlier, resonated with. But I didn't think that much more about it because I was quite involved in, in I'd just broken up from a relationship just prior to my flying home and I was also um, wondering will I stay in Australia, will I go back overseas, what, what's my next step. Um, and so I saw you again a couple of weeks later, didn't I? You came and did another talk mm. and at that time I wanted to ask him some questions, you know, what's all this about and what do you think about this? I've always had an interest in spirituality. Um, and so I, I thought, oh, this guy, I'll, I'll talk to him about that. And he was quite shy and reserved. And I thought, I want to hear, like, come on, talk more. And he wasn't very forthcoming. And I, I later learned that he was quite in, uh, nervous, but uh, I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. And then another month or so passed and um, AJ went off on a world trip. And my parents mentioned to me that someone else had told them that um, he felt that I was his soulmate. And that had a very strange effect on me, just sitting in my parents' kitchen this time. And the first words out of my mouth were, I knew it. And I thought, no, I didn't know that. And that's very weird, you know. Anyway, my parents thought that that was, oh, we've told you, whatever, we'll get on with things. And, and, but I couldn't let it go. It started off this process in me of feeling very unusual like I felt like yeah I, there's something I need to investigate here um, for myself and um, eventually after another few months or perhaps it was a month or two yeah probably a month or two I, and can't I remember, remember receiving an email from you on Valentine's Day yeah it was a t it was a one-line email <laughs> that said what's going on <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah. very typical of Mary. <laughs> yeah, I don't like to beat around the bush. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to find out what, what's all this about. And, and then we commenced just an email friendship um, for a time and some phone calls in there as well. And, and as I said earlier, I was very dubious about this idea of being um, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. But I, I just followed my um, curiosity and my instinct um, to learn more, and as I did. But you made some rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had a rule. I said up front, I don't want to know anything about what you remember about a first century life or anything you remember supposedly about me because I don't want any of my experience to be tainted by anything that you might say. If I'm going to have an experience or any kind of memory or I was, as I said, very dubious, then I, I don't want to have any doubt or fear that it could have mm. anyway come from you. So the suggestion was never made to you by AJ that you were Mary Magdalene? No, no. Obviously when I contacted him and I asked him, he told me that that was his opinion, but he certainly didn't approach me at any point and tell me. You thought that first before he told you it was his opinion? <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you could say Mary thought it. <laughs> <laughs> I felt it, She maybe. felt, felt like, it. Yeah. She felt it. She felt yeah. it. And, yeah. and she also um, thought that she'd be able to convince me that I wasn't Jesus exactly. that and, was that I, and that I was wrong completely with everything. Have you ever suggested to anybody else that they're Mary Magdalene? Um, no, I haven't suggested to anyone they're Mary Magdalene. I have, uh, people have told me, oh, I think such and such is Mary Magdalene and I've gone to investigate. <laughs> but every time I've met up with those people, I've, I've thought, no, that's not. There was, a, there was one lady, however, that uh, I lived with uh, before, uh, and we'd broken up uh, before I started going through my memories, and uh, and I strongly suspect that she was uh, for quite some period of time, and and she actually asked me, and I said, yeah, I, I do think you are, um, but but as I worked through different memories, I then realised she, she wasn't a part of those memories, so um, so she couldn't be. So, so did you did you come here looking for Mary? It's gone. Oh, it's gone. Uh, it's time to, um, time to change discs. Change discs, okay. And, uh, we won't pull that through. We've done a little, little shuffle. So are we following a pattern so far? A pattern? No. 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 Good. It's no. Good. Pleasant, pleasant change of... Oh, okay. That's good. Pleasant change of... Uh, 
change of pace. The, the only trouble with an interview though like this is you, you can't explain all the detail. I know. You, you're trying to summarise the detail. Mm. And it's very hard to summarise yeah. detail, isn't it? Well, it's, it's several movies, full, isn't it? If you want to, your story is yeah. a long, long story. Um, well, that's why I was include, thinking that the interview could be. If you include our memories from the first century, two thousand years of our existence in the spirit world, and now, it's sort of how like, many days have you got? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly, it would take yeah, a long time. So hard. Um, yeah. It would take a long time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and to answer like, yeah, some of the questions in full would take a long time. So try to, I don't know. So you're continually having memories, new mm -hmm. stuff is mm -hmm. coming to you mm -hmm. from your previous life. Mm -hmm. Both of us, that's happening. Yeah. 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 And it's definitely related to how emotionally open, open I allow yeah. myself to be. Which is, if you compare that to people who have, I mean that happens with memory all the time mm. for everyone. You if, sort of need an access point to memory, you know. And yeah. also if something very traumatic has happened in somebody's past, they'll often block out a lot of it and the details. And then when they open up... Mm. Um, they'll clarify. It yeah. comes mm. out, yeah. Mm. John, yeah. can you travel right a bit for me? Yeah. Yeah. Are we going down this road a, a, a bit more? Or the, sorry, what are we talking about? The, the, the memories and their background. You can go a bit further right, John. Yeah, you said about that. You you have have that's right, right. yeah. yeah. So did, you said... Are you, are you rolling? I am. Yeah, so did you, did, I mean, is, have, once you started remembering who you were, did you start seeking Mary? Pretty your, much, yeah. Your long lost like, lover. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Like, I've always had this feeling that I was missing her, you know, so, and, and um, I did believe at one point in time that a previous partner was probably Mary Magdalene. And then as I worked through for more and more of my em emotional issues and, and had more memories, it, I realised that she wasn't a part of those memories. So it was pretty much impossible for her to be Mary Magdalene. And then I got to a point where basically other people told me they were Mary Magdalene. So I would, I would you know, obviously meet up with them at some point And every time I felt, no, that, that I can see that they're not. And, 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 and in fact, I got to the point where I felt that I might not even meet her, um, in fact, and so I was living alone for, well, by this stage I've been living alone for five years, pretty much, and um, I knew that I had to, if I was ever going to meet her, I had to work through emotional issues. I had to work through issues regarding women that I had within myself that I needed to release and so forth, and as I do, did more and more of that, I, I felt attracted to come to Queensland. At this point, I was living in South Australia, and I felt like my Mary's probably somewhere up in Queensland. For some reason, I felt that, and I just decided to trust those feelings. And and so I, I finished up buying the property that we're now having the interview with. with. Um, and and I lived here for a couple of years. In fact, most of the time I spent overseas actually, rather than living here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I was invited to, as Mary pointed out, I've. I, I met with Mary's mum and dad without even knowing that they were Mary's parents or I, they didn't show me a picture of Mary until well within my visiting their home. And even when I looked at the picture of Mary, I didn't feel necessarily that she was Mary. Um, so it had nothing to do with her physical appearance or anything like that. But as soon as I, as soon as I met her face to face and could feel her, bang, that was, that was it. That's, I knew she was Mary. And... Uh, and that's what made me feel nervous, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but what are the odds of that? I mean, yeah, you know, you really lucked out, didn't you? You, you found Mary as a gorgeous Australian she is. A woman, you know. She could be 85 and out of, out of Kazakhstan or True, something. True. Uh, I mean. And I was fully expecting that that was possible. <laughs> I knew she would have to be younger than I because I knew I was the first of the 14 to, to come back to Earth. So I knew she would be younger than I, I but that's about all I knew. Um, I didn't know where she would be. I suspect that she would have come to Australia as well as, uh, as uh, along with myself because that's what soulmates would normally do. They'd normally get attracted to the same locations. Um, but aside from that, I didn't know anything. And so, that, of course, any person that, you know, I, was, I, I, I wanted to find Mary, but when, when you say when I wanted to find Mary, I didn't want to have a relationship with someone who wasn't Mary. So, so it wasn't like I was trying to, f to find somebody and turn them into Mary. Yep. Do you think you'll marry Mary? Well, we're already married. If we, We've already been married once. We got married in the first century. And, mm. and the soulmate relationship is, such, is, is really the only marriage that God has created. 
Um, so we don't see any need for a paper, but we probably get married, I would say. Um, if we feel like a party. If we feel, <laughs> it, it, once everyone's been confronted enough <laughs> about the fact that we're not. Because clearly there's a lot of significance, isn't there, placed on um, a certificate of marriage as uh, as, as a binding, as a binding um, contract that is acceptable to God. And both of us feel that there's a much deeper binding that happens in your heart, and mm. that's what true marriage is. So there is probably in both of us a little bit of a feeling that we'd like to demonstrate that that's what true marriage is before mm. we go and get a piece of paper. Mm. Yeah. What are soulmates, though? Because this is a... A lot of people said, well, this is really new age, this soulmate thing. But your <laughs> definition of soulmate is quite different from it's very many different. people's. Can, yeah. can I say, though, like, it's, it's really new age? To me, it's funny how a lot of our teachings are repeated back to us as if, as if they didn't come from us. They came from me 2,000 years ago, the teachings of soulmates. Mm -hmm. so, so, so while the new age movement has imbibed the teaching of soulmates, whereas the Christian movement has not, and, and other religious faiths haven't, the reality is I taught about soulmates in the first century, so it's not a new age <laughs> movement teaching. It's a teaching of Jesus that was lost, just like there are many other teachings of Jesus that were lost. So It's not very clearly represented in the new age movement, though, is it? There, there's, well, it's not how we taught it then. Well, they have, a, they have two terms. They have a twin fame term, which is like your one and only soulmate, and then they have soulmates, which is many of such, and that's not the case at all. The reality is God's made a complete soul which has masculine and feminine qualities which splits in half at the time of the first incarnation. And, and so those two halves belong to each other. And you can't, it's somebody that God made, so you can't go and choose them. It's like a lot of people would like to, <laughs> but you can't go and choose them and, and, and turn somebody into your soulmate. They are either your soulmate or not. It's just one of those truths of God. And I recognised that in the first century when I was quite young in my teens, that, that I had another half of myself. And, uh, and that's why I did not engage any uh, relationship with any woman all the way through my teens and 20s, which was very unusual in the first century. In the first century, generally, most people were married, particularly a man was married usually by his 20s. And, and the woman he was married to was usually quite young. And then he, they, he obtained a series of wives, generally. It was a family contract. Exactly. Mm. Uh, and usually these contracts were, were actually made by the parents uh, rather than the children being involved at all. And a lot of times there wasn't much love involved either. And, uh, and these contracts, uh, which are still occurring today, in fact, in many countries, uh, are completely out of harmony with love of the individual and also out of harmony with God's principles in the sense that that if we love each other, that is the binding contract. And, and it's only while we love that, that there is a binding contract. As soon as one of us falls out of love with another, then the contract has failed. And, and I feel the main reason why contracts fail is that most people are not, uh, or mo a lot of people are not with their soulmates. And of course, even if they are with their soulmates, uh, they often get confronted emotionally through the relationship. Whereas we get confronted emotionally in the relationship, uh, as you do with your soulmate generally, and what we do is we work through the issue. So, and that's what we encourage other people to do with their relationships. Should you marry somebody who's not your soulmate? Well, you have free will, so you're allowed to decide to do whatever you wish. And if you wish to marry someone who's not your soulmate, then certainly go ahead and do that if that's what you wish. Free will is a gift given by God. Now, of course, if God made another half of you and you've married someone else who is not your other half, then then you've also married someone else who's somebody else's other half. And you've also, there are a few of God's laws that are broken in that, in that place, which sooner or later will be confronted. Now, I talked about this in the first century quite frequently with Pharisees who asked me questions about, you know, if a person married one person and then he died and married another person and he died and they, married, and they said seven times and did that, which one would be their husband in the heavens? And I said that none of them would be. That, that they would become like the angels of the heavens. And I, and I was referring here specifically to the soulmate relationship, which is, which is something that God established. So the woman would end up with her soulmate, not necessarily with any of the seven that she married. There are a lot of Christians out there who will say, well, this is just attacking the family and marriage. You know, the institution of marriage is sacred. If you're representing Jesus, sure, you cannot be attacking marriage. Well, uh, you know, in the first century, almost everybody who heard me speak found something that was confronting. 
And I suggest that almost everyone today who hears me speak will find something that's confronting. The reality is a paper contract between two people on this earth means nothing to God. And if you do believe it means something to God, then you don't have a very good opinion of God. The reality is that God has already made a contract between the two halves of the soul by creating them as halves. And, and the reality is sooner or later in your future, whether it's here on earth or in the spirit world, you will find those halves. I am not promoting immorality. So I'm not promoting a succession of partners a, as an experiment to find out which one was your soulmate. Right? And I've never promoted that because I believe strongly in morality. However, sooner or later, a person on earth or in the spirit world in their future will find their soulmate. And they will find that that person is the ideal person for them to be with for the rest of their life because they are the other half of themselves. And to me, it's just a scientific fact. It's not... It's like many other things that many religions complain about. You know, when they hear a science, a scientist proclaim a fact, they often get up in arms about those particular facts. But the reality is they're either scientific facts or they aren't. And in, in the case of soulmates, it's a scientific fact. And there are many people, and, and almost everyone in the spirit world in the higher dimensions knows about this fact. And uh, unfortunately, we don't know about it much on Earth. That's the problem. Well, the scientific facts we know about on Earth are generally um, <laughs> provable through mathematics. Let's, you know, we, we were talking yesterday about gravity and about yes. aerodynamics and the speed of light and what have you, m most of which we really can only prove through mathematics. But we've also proven a lot of things we can't see through mathematics. Yeah. So, so how will mathematics, will science ever be able to prove, for example, the existence of God, the existence of a soul, the existence of soul mates? And, well, the mathematics involving God are always infinite in nature. Every quality that God has, has an infinite capacity to it. So it has an infinite nature to it. So if you look at love, for example, it has an infinite nature when it comes from God. If you look at truth, it's the same. It has an infinite nature when it comes to God. So I'm not sure about whether mathematics is ever going to be able to prove the existence of God, because you would have to come up with some mathematics based on infinity. The The... As regards everything God's created, yes, everything that God has created has a mathematical formula associated with it, pretty much. So, yes, I do believe you'll be able to prove soulmates through a mathematical formula. And in fact, in the future, I believe we will be able to tell you what the mathematical <laughs> formula is. And uh, as there will be many mathematical formulas that we'll be able to uh, give to the world through that teach about things like uh, a spirit world, what, how many dimensions currently exist, how many poten dimensions can potentially exist, and so forth, all have mathematical formulas associated with them. How do you prove then the existence of God? Well, the existence of God has to be an experience. This is something I've said right from the first century onwards, it has to be a personal experience. Once you've received love from God, you will know God's existence and you will not doubt it ever. It's only when you receive this love from God that you will start to establish this relationship with God and can be able to communicate with God soul to soul. Once you can establish this relationship and experiment with this relationship, you will find for certain that God exists, but only then. And I haven't found any mathematical formulas that refer to, that, to, to God in my whole of 2,000 years of existence, but I have found millions of mathematical formulas that refer to everything God's created. So um, my suggestion to people is to focus on experimenting uh, just like a scientist would, experiment with the concept of having a relationship and, uh, and then work your way through the experiment like as a, as a scientist would, like measure the results. Have <laughs> and, faith. Well, you need initially faith, but it's not the kind of faith uh, that's based on nothing. It's the kind of faith that's based on some facts. The fact is that we, we've been created with a beautiful body. We've been created with a beautiful planet to live on that we are destroying, but it, was, it is a beautiful planet. It has these recovery mechanisms. Our body has these recovery mechanisms. We have a, a lot of joy that, are all, that, that is all present in the world in which we live that somebody has to get, have gifted to us. And so we have plenty of sort of evidence or circumstantial evidence, shall we call it, that perhaps there is a creator who, who loves us and a creator who actually has some care for us. And so my suggestion is that we, while it, we may say faith is required, um, I don't believe that, that there isn't enough circumstantial evidence to at least try the experiment. There are quite a few people who say that uh, not only does God not exist, but 
nor does your soul exist. There's no evidence for that. The, the, the soul really is just part of your brain. Um, yeah. That, that, um, well, they don't even believe a spirit body exists. They that's right. Only that, in the physical. Yeah. yeah. So they look at the Big Bang that the creation started uh, through um, quantum physics mm -hmm. you know, and, and the understanding of quantum physics. The scientists physics. aren't all certain about the Big Bang. Um, the Big Bang is the commonly uh, felt creation of, of the universe, but the reality is there are plenty of scientists who, who feel that the Big Bang hasn't occurred. It wasn't the source of the universe. And in fact, if you look at the things that scientists are now discovering about how about things like dark flow and dark matter and other things like that, you can see that there are a lot of questions that are unanswered when it comes to even the origin of the universe. And, and I feel as long as we remain open to the experimentation, we will find the answers to all these questions. Now, there are many spirits in the spirit world have, who have already found the answers to these questions and who are trying to communicate these answers to people on Earth. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people on Earth who are very blocked to such communication. You don't accept the Big Bang? No, I'm not saying I don't accept it. Um, I don't accept that it happened the way scientists currently believe it happened. No, I don't. How did it happen then? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you for certain. The reason why I can't tell you for certain is because I did not personally observe it. And, and all I can do is do the same as scientists currently do with a whole set of laws that I know about. And, and, but the laws that I know about uh, tend to indicate something completely different as the source, as a combination of these things. The problem with the Big Bang Theory is that, is that it has been a, a slow awakening over a long period of time of scientists. And they've come up with problems at different stages of the theory. And then they've introduced new theories. To, and it sort of now became like a conundrum of theories, um, trying to explain how different things that, are, that have been measurable have occurred. Isn't that how scientists work, though? Is it, it's is exactly. It hypothesis which are then either confirmed or ruled out. And yes, and, and I'm not disagreeing with that methodology. I feel that that is the methodology we need to focus on with everything, including the spirit body and the soul. Mm. We need to have an openness to that kind of methodology about everything we discover. So what we need to do is we need to forget about trying to come up, trying to fit, fit things into rules. And what we need to do is go through this experimental, exper experimenting process that is a part of the scientific methodology on every subject, not just on subjects related to the physical, the origin of the universe, the origin of mankind and so forth, but in terms of our physical body, but also whether we can actually perform experiments that are about the spiritual, the spiritual body and the soul. Whether we can, we, if somebody comes up, there's plenty of people that have come up with the concept that a soul exists. That's been existing for thousands and thousands of years, right from the times of Plato and Socrates. Um, and there's whole been whole concepts of spirit body being existing all the way through history in many different faiths. Um, but but if, if all of these ideas are present, what we need to do is have scientists that are open enough to experiment with these particular ideas rather than just saying, no, that's not possible at all before they even experiment. So I don't feel it's very wise for us to, to stop experimentation in any way, physically, from a soul perspective, or from a spirit body perspective. Does the evolution uh, fit in with your concept of the spirit world? Things do evolve. Things do change. The reality is that God, uh, God's love raises the potential. So the more and more that God's love that permeates the universe, um, the, the more the potential of the universe raises and therefore the potential of the creations in the universe change. And so we have major shifts, if you like, in what can come about or come into existence as a result of this love. And higher intelligence can come into existence as a result of more and more love being present. So, so yes, I do believe there is, uh, there is an evolutionary process. However, I don't believe that the human soul is an evolutionary process. Uh, from what I have observed in the spirit world and also what I've felt from God, um, is this God created the human soul. And while the human body may have gone through an evolutionary process for its creation, the soul's incarnation into the body is a process that God designed specifically. And uh, the very first human couple that I've managed to talk to, Ammon and a man, who the Bible refers to as Adam and Eve, they, they, uh, they remember themselves being the only persons on this planet at one point in time and, and coming into existence as an adult uh, without any um, child, 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 um, childhood, childhood and, and without having any parents. 
and this tells me that, that the creation of the human soul is obviously something that God created rather than what come about through an evolutionary process. So you don't accept that sort of Homo sapiens uh, managed to evolve into standing up uh, hominoids uh, 200,000 years ago and we've progressed in, uh, as a result of evolution and well, there's spiritual a few, sense since then. Yeah, there's a few problems with those kind of suppositions. One, one is that it uh, firstly is just looking at the physical. So it's only looking at the physical form. Now, I do believe the physical form may have evolved over many hundreds of thousands of years, in fact. I'm not saying that the physical form did not evolve. What I'm saying is that the very first human couple were incarnated into a physical form that could reproduce, and they incarnated into these perfect physical forms. Now, whether that physical form was created or not, nobody can really say because nobody observed it. All we can do is make suppositions. We have a lot of skeletons around the place that suggest it, though, <laughs> don't we? Yes, we do. However, there's one other thing that mankind hasn't considered, and that is the degradation of man over hundreds of thousands of years. And what these, these spirits that I've spoken to in the spirit world who were alive at the beginning of this period of time, they said that man degraded, degraded so, so much that man lived only a few years, up to 20 years generally, and they, they became all bent over and, and, and short and small uh, through a process of degradation of the human soul. So, so I feel one of the things historically that can't be measured because, because there's no way of measuring it without talking to these people who observed it is the degradation of humanity and then the subsequent evolution, if you like, of humanity uh, that occurred as a result of the improvement in the human soul and its condition. Um, there have been uh, uh, reports that you've predicted um, earth changes coming. Yep. Uh, are they hunches or are you or guesstimates <laughs> or are you saying nasty things are definitely going to happen? Um, the best way I could say them is that they're personal opinions, which is a very different to what I've talked about so far when it comes to soulmates or when it comes to you know, God and God's love and what can happen in terms of the transformation of the human soul, that the human soul exists and those kind of things. I, all of those kind of things are facts that I know for certain. Anything that is going to happen in the future, I don't know for certain. I've never known it for certain. And in the first century, I actually stated, I don't know it for certain. And, and now I can't state that I know anything in the future for certain. So when somebody asks me my personal opinion, I give them my personal opinion. Because I'm open enough to give them my personal opinion, knowing that it might be wrong. And as long as people are aware that it might be wrong, I'm fine with giving them my personal opinion. What's your personal opinion? So my personal opinion is, yes, there are going to be changes that occur on this earth that are quite significant, much more significant than we've experienced up to this time, as a result of the way in which we are acting towards the earth and the amount of fear that's present inside of mankind at this present time. So I, st I still do believe that there will be things occurring on this earth that will be quite significant events that may cause large-scale destruction, depend but, but not because God's doing anything about it and not because of any other thing than the earth itself reacting to mankind's treatment of it. Hmm. Global warming. Well, global warming, I suppose, is another debatable thing, isn't it? Like, it's, like many things, uh, you know, there are often a, there's often a political agenda, uh, a religious agenda, and an environmental agenda, and they're all often in complete opposition to each other. I, I, feel, I feel, though, if you look at what we're doing to the planet, we are still continuing to rape it at extreme rates and the soil is degrading, the water is degrading, everything is degrading quite rapidly. And unless we change, if we stay on the same course we are currently, then the earth is going to re respond violently at some point. Because of the, there's just so many systems that could respond violently. For example, if you look at the system that, where the seawater is moved around or war to create warm climates and so forth, if that, if that shuts down through too much salination and so forth, uh, too much salt, uh, then, then we could have severe weather events occurring that we've never seen before, just through that one event. And then if you look at how we're pumping at huge rates oil out of the earth, and, and which creates obviously caverns, and then we're pumping things back into that, and, and we're creating all of these different things inside of the earth itself. Obviously, sooner or later, that is going to have an effect from a physical perspective. But even bigger than that, is the soul-based effect that we have on our environment when we live in fear. 
to me, that's what I have observed in 2,000 years of my life in the spirit world. Fear has the largest effect on every single thing God has ever created. And, and so as a result of that, mankind's fear, it seems to cycle. It seems to go up and down and up and down. But if it gets to, to highly intense play, t- times, then we could potentially have intense events as a result of that. One, one report quoted you as saying that, that a great wave will wash over Australia. Yeah, I do. That... I still believe that. I still yeah. believe. I don't know how far it will wash over Australia or how big it will be. And I feel that will depend very much upon things like you know, the condition of people and how much they respond to what's going on already. So, so it, to me, it's a changing thing. Like if, if mankind sees where they're headed and we start changing everything, we start, we start looking at everything more intelligently and we start trying to do everything in harmony with the, the balance of the earth, then of course any of these events will be much lower in their nature and much less intense. But, but if mankind continues on his current path, then it's highly likely that, that, that we'll need some fairly intense events before we'll change our minds in terms of what we choose. And I do believe there'll be continents rising, continents falling, and all sorts of different potential events that have occurred historically. There's been seven times in, 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 uh, in human history where these kind of events have occurred and uh, over the past 250,000 years. And, uh, and I feel that we're due for another one if we don't, keep, if we don't change. Mm. Yeah. The, the Australian media have given you a pretty hard time. <laughs> Would that be fair to say, do uh, you think? I don't know. If, if you Some can... elements of the Australian media. Yeah, media. there's a lot of lies in it. I don't know if they've given us a hard time, but right. there's a lot of lies presented, I agree. Well, tell us, um, one, of the, one of the things that I've seen is that you've been accused of running a cult. Mm. Do so what th- do you think, John? Well, what do you think? <laughs> do you run a cult? What's your definition of a cult? Uh, well, I... Th- We've put on a Frequently Asked Questions channel on YouTube of my definition of the cult, so any person who wants to see that will be able to see what, what I, how I define a cult. I, I personally would define a cult as, a, as, a, as people who are severely controlling of any other group of people. So uh, under those circumstances, you can almost say most religions are cults and, <laughs> um, and, and even most political parties are cults and so forth. Um, we don't push anybody into doing anything. In fact, we teach just the opposite, that, mm-hmm. that each of us needs to be responsible for um, the way we use our will, the way the choices we make in our life. And, and often when people come to us to ask us questions about their personal life, which it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen at times, we're very um, certain to say that, look, you need to make your own decisions about mm-hmm. what's going on. We present a set of teachings that um, represent what it means to become more loving and we endeavour to um, display and convey those things to people. But then we feel it's very much up to them what they do with what we present, whether they choose to um, take those things to heart or not. It's completely up to them. And I, th- we... I think the main reason why the, the media thinks we're a cult is just because I'm saying that I'm Jesus. And they, they basically assume that anybody who's saying that Jesus must be a cult leader mm. or must be trying to boss other people around. And that's not the way yeah, we feel or at to, all. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. Or to um, ask others to worship us, which is certainly quite... Uh, repulsive thought to us. We, we feel very and, strongly that we Yeah, and the Australian media still keep saying that I'm saying that I'm God when I'm not, quite plainly not yeah. saying that I'm God. Yeah. And the Australian media still keep repeating that I, because I'm claiming I'm Jesus, I must be saying that I'm God yeah. and so forth. And you don't have a compound? No, no. well, uh, you can see our compound. <laughs> we, <laughs> our we live together <laughs> alone and, um, yeah. yeah, we... Uh, the only group gatherings we have are the seminars, such as you and your crew attended over the weekend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you don't have a church, really, do you? As no. such, I mean, it's not an or- not even an organisation, really, in no. that yeah. sense. Yeah. No. no, the only we have a Divine Truth organisation, part proprietary limited organisation that we've created just to as a business sort of thing to for accounting to, for purposes. accounting purposes to put everything in that, you know, and uh, and the one main reason why we created that was if something happens to us that somebody else can take over that company and continue running it and hopefully continue sharing the truths that we've already taught. One of the allegations was that you were splitting up families, couples, um, (laughs) because, you know, with the soulmate concept that, you know, one party might want to go off and look after their soulmate. Is that not true? (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, we 
if we meet uh, two people who are in a partnership uh, as a couple, our initial uh, feelings are that something brought you guys together. Mm. And if it was love, then, and you're not feeling loving towards each other right now, mm. then there are things that you can look at inside of yourself to, to work beyond this point so that you can feel love for one another. We're always uh, teaching about love. And so, no, I wouldn't say that we would ever advise anyone um, against their partner, really. You're probably more eloquent in answering Yeah, that. I, I would say the only circumstance where I suggest a person should leave their partner is when their partner's being violent. Yeah. Um, other than that, a person needs to work through the emotional things that brought them together. And if they do have emotional problems in the relationship, they need to address them. They need to specifically address them rather than ignoring them. Once they do that, I think it will become quite clear to them whether they are soulmates or not. If they are, they'll stay together. If they're not, sometime in the future, they will part. I don't believe the soulmate teaching gives anyone a justification for immoral behaviour. In other words, you know, just going bed hopping, you know, from one so-called soulmate to another so-called soulmate and so forth. I, I feel if a person is really sincere about the teaching, they will work through all of the, the uh, blockages they have towards their soulmate, which are all usually blockages they have with their mother or father, depending on what gender they are. And once they've de dealt with those particular emotional things, they will generally attract their soulmate into their life and they'll know who it is when they meet them. Now, if they're currently married and they meet their soulmate under those circumstances, well, if they love their partner, the person they're married to, they will not just go, oh, see you later, I'm off with my soulmate. They will firstly work through the issues of, of the, the, the dispersion of the relationship. They won't just run away from the relationship and run away from their children and run away from their responsibilities. Um, that all the, all the things that they've created throughout their life, they wouldn't do that. If they truly loved their partner that they've been with, they wouldn't do that. So has Divine yeah. Truth, the, the, the whole message, been responsible for breaking up couples in any way? That, that, that have, any, 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 anyone that's joined you or followed you uh, ended up splitting up because of what you've taught? I'm Probably. I'm trying to recollect. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I say, resoundingly, the feedback we get from most people is, thank you for saving our marriage. Yes, that's the most, um, the most Yes, we are closer now than we've ever been. We hear that often. Yeah. Um, but I can probably call to mind one person um, who has, um, their marriage has broken up since, since they started coming to seminars and they realised there were certain issues in their relationship yeah. uh, that were not resolvable. They attempted to resolve them for two years and at that point they thought this is, it's not loving to... And both um, of them thought somebody else was their soulmate, so they... If you're thinking about the same couple, there must I be am. two. I'm thinking about um, Joy and her husband. Oh, I'm yeah. thinking about Chris. Ah, so there'd yeah. be two. There'd be two couples that personally. we know of. But certainly, both lots of those couples remained uh, in partnerships for at least two years uh, um, after hearing the teachings. They attempted very firmly to work through the issues. And in the case you're referring to, um, the guys both felt like actually we still have high regard for each other, but we're not. You know, we don't We're feel not like in love we with each other anymore, yeah. and we need to split up. Mm. What yeah. about the so-called <laughs> psychological barbed wire? I've, I've in fact run into this with other, co you know, other, not other cults. I mean, with the cults. <laughs> excuse me. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. <coughs> well, I start on again. What about what they call psychological barbed wire? If somebody leaves you, will they be ostracised? No. No. And in um, fact, many people leave us, come back. Many people have been angry with me for five years, and I've still treated them well <laughs> in that entire time. And um, because a lot of people get angry about what we teach, you know, there's certain things that we teach that are quite confronting emotionally to, to receive. And so, so I can be just speaking about them from a platform and people in the audience will already be feeling angry and upset and confronted and some of them walk out and we've had sometimes a third of the audience walk out when I've said some things. And, uh, and, and that's fine, like I don't have any problem with that. They, come, they can come back anytime they want. The only issues we have is if, if they treat us badly in our own seminars that we give for free, then we, we want them to leave until they can come back and treat us well in our own seminars. Um, if somebody expects to come to a seminar and abuse us, then we'd say, ask them to leave. And if they wouldn't leave, then I'd certainly ask the police to come and ask them to leave. Um, because I just feel that that's just disrespectful, not only to ourselves, but also to other people. Uh, who, who are present. Yeah, but certainly but, there's a number of people that I know who've come to seminars and who've said, look, this, 
this is not for me, and I'm still maintain a friendship with them. Mm. Uh, we still have many friends and and people who we interact with on a day to day basis who who don't come to seminars. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now the. I suspect this is, I'm not going to make a statement because I said I wouldn't, but, um, you know, there have been current affairs programs here in Australia that have, that have portrayed you as a cult, that have, that have mm -hmm. portrayed you as, as evil, really. You know, yeah, um, how yeah. do you feel about that when you see, <laughs> see something like that? I feel it's funny. <laughs> because it just, the reason I feel it's funny is that anybody who knows me certainly knows I'm not evil, right? And I think it's funny, too, from a, from a perspective of, like trying to force people into having a certain opinion when when it's quite obvious that the people who are around us don't have that opinion of me whatsoever and, and i'm sure you've managed to talk to quite a few people since you've been here of who, who are around us and they certainly don't have an opinion of me that i'm some evil, evil megalomaniac you know power hungry person who's seeking to be god or anything like that and uh, and so sometimes the, the, most of my mostly my feelings are amusement. Mary's I haven't always been amusement. Mine haven't always been amusement. Uh, yes. um, when when that first started happening, I got quite upset. You know, I felt very. Um, I probably felt somehow hurt and betrayed, and I, and I had to work through quite a bit about feeling very disillusioned. I always thought that I I knew that. You needed to treat what the media said with, a, you know, recognise that there might be some slant or bias in the reporting. But when um, a number of different media uh, outlets or programs reported blatant lies about us, I found that very disillusioning. Uh, I thought I, I just didn't believe that that could happen, and I was probably, yeah, I was felt very hurt for for a time. I feel much more... And now you don't really believe anything the media says, do you? <laughs> well, I have to say, it kind of ruined me for a lot of yeah. a lot of news reporting. I said to AJ the other day, I'm sticking to movies and novels because I, at least I know that they're, that they're <laughs> that fiction. <is> fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I, I also now have a different attitude. I feel if I, my responsibility is just to be myself and anyone who I interact with in the media, it's up to them to... You know, it's their personal ethical issue with mm. what they do with that, and mm. and I feel much more at peace with that now. Mm. Um, and I'm I'm pleased to say that we've had some nicer interviews since that time. So, mm. so that's there good. must be thousands of people who have seen you and heard your story and thought, oh my God, they're in La La Land, you know. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and what do you say to them? <laughs> uh, look, this is one of my major issues. Um, when I met AJ, I thought. No way, no. Especially when I started having memories, I, I was like, no way. I don't. I don't want to be uh, one of these people who seem all spiritual and completely out of touch with reality of what's <laughs> actually going on, because that is very much against my nature. I'm yeah. a very pragmatic kind of person, and and being confronted with these memories uh, in a way, and confronting my brain with them. I couldn't, I couldn't explain them and it was very scary for me. Um, but I, I've gone through a lot around it and I can tell you definitively, I don't believe we're in La La Land. <laughs> Maybe everyone in La La Land thinks that they're not in La La Land, but... <laughs> Isn't that the definition yeah, of a crazy man? that's probably he doesn't think he's crazy. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 craziness is when you, get, when you would do something, make a mistake again and again and again and then don't learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but however... You Under know, that definition, everyone on the planet is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the, there is this perception though, isn't there? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, is there anything that would convince you that you are in La La Land? Is there anything that, that what would it take to, to, to convince you that actually you are Mary Luck and you weren't uh, Mary Magdalene of the first century and in fact the man that you're in love with is not Jesus really, he's just a, a nice guy from the he's bush. He's just a very <laughs> naughty boy. He's just a naughty boy. <laughs> That's a really good question. What would it take to convince me of that? It's very hard to think of something that would... You know, I used to shop for these reasons. I would think of Mary them all. Mary was on the lookout I've, for them all constantly. I've been through a checklist, you know, of things yeah. where I thought, oh, this is what's really happening. And I'd go down that route and then I'd think, no, that... No, I, I can't deny... Have you ever heard of recovered memories? I have, yeah. yeah. And I have my own uh, beliefs about that. I feel that often people who um, begin to have memories that are recovered um, 
that yeah. later through hypnosis and things as a suggestion, general, yeah. suggestion mm -hmm. um, that very often what happens is that spirits become involved with them, give them a series of their own memories, which the, the person, person then takes on as their own. Mm -hmm. They experience them like they're their own. And, um, and that's why sometimes, you know... We've met you, many people like that. Yeah, yeah. Many people who say they're somebody, you know, from, a, from an age old, mm -hmm. and, then, and we can see the spirits with them and mm. see that the spirits with them are that person, but the, the spirit's just feeding them information that the person then assumes is their own information and their own memories. How do you know that's and not happening to you then? It's a good question. It's a great question, and it's something that I've um, felt a lot about. Um, again, how, do you, so how do you know it's not you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? I know how I know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah you, you can answer for yourself, obviously. Um, and I'm trying to condense the answer because I've been through a lot of uh, uh, imaginings and thought processes about it. Um, but basically, I, I am a spirit medium myself, so I do speak with spirits. So I understand, I have a sense of what it is like to speak with a spirit and experience a spirit's memories and emotions. And that is something very different to what I experience when I'm having memories. There is also the other um, additional issue, which is that I don't experience sights or smells uh, or sounds when I have memories. And this is very common for people who have recovered memories and also people who are communicating with spirits. My memories are purely emotional. They come, and this is why um, certain things about dates and names are not, uh, they come to me yeah, well, they're not, never going to come to me, the exact date that something happened, because the way I experience a memory is that it is an emotional thing. Like if you're remembering something when you were three or before you had the brain development, I suppose, to, to see or hear, you just have the emotional experience of it. And that is, that is, um, that is always the case with when I, when I remember something. So, and I, I feel I have developed discernment between those two things. But you answer. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's very easy when you can see and feel spirits around you yeah. as to know who's around you. So, um, you know, I, I know who's around me when I'm feeling certain things. And, and so, uh, and, and we can easily see them or feel, and feel them and speak with them. And in every case, there's no one around me when I'm, when I'm working way through my own memories. So they are, like I know them as my own memories. They are my personal experience. And, uh, and I know other people were going to come up with all sorts of explanations as to how this could be happening. Like I understand that, I do. I understand that people will want to suppose that we might be crazy or that we might be evil or that we might be trying to mislead people or we might be having a joke with humankind or we might, you know, there's, there's literally heaps of different options of what people will probably try to come up with. At some point in their future, I believe, they'll all come to terms with the fact that with the amount of th things that we know and the amount of things that we're going to be able to still continue to share with people, um, sooner or later, people will start questioning the material because it all, it all makes sense and it all joins together and it all has a logical, logical uh, structure. And sooner or later, people are going to start, say, asking where all this information is coming from. And, and then they might be more open to listening to it. Um, at this point in time, I think it's early days, to be frank. And I feel that during early days of any, anything that gets established on this earth, usually the first period of time is ridicule and, and laughter. And challenge. And, and by, challenge. By the status quo. Exactly. Um, and then after that, generally it's anger, <laughs> you know, where everyone starts getting angry about what's being said. And then sooner or later, other people start thinking about it more and feeling about it more. And then, and then eventually the truth gets established over a period of time, I feel. And that's basically what's going to happen with us. And, and that's what I expect to have happen. And, and also that's what, uh, you know, that I was worried about having ha happen when I first had these memories, you know, I, I didn't want to go through that. I didn't, I, I wanted to have, every memory possible, all at my fingertips so that I could prove every point at that point in time. Now, I, I, I'm not focused on that at all anymore. My focus is on teaching what we know to be true and, um, and discussing with people 
particularly the truth about God and the truth about a relationship with God and the truth about what creates happiness and, and then let people make up their own minds. And I feel that the majority of people on this planet have a heart that has been affected by some love in the sense that, you know, they know, they, they know when they're being loved and when they're not, generally, most people. And, and they know most people on the planet also have some kind of desire to love, even though they might have certain oppressions and certain angers and other, other problems that come up. Most people want to experience love. And, and I feel as that love draws them, there's a good chance that myself and Mary will get treated the same way as anybody else gets treated and, uh, and hopefully, therefore, survive longer than we did in the first century, giving the message that we're currently giving. <laughs> And if my, if my prediction of that future is not accurate, well, that was my own personal opinion. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> no worries. Chaz, um, what, have you got any more? So there's, you know, I, I, sorry to keep going, but the seminar itself, I was yep. just like, I, one, one, some people, um, particularly having seen what other current affairs programs have done and talking about the cult issue, would have been surprised by the fact that not at any time, really over the two days, there was a couple of references about the first century, but not at any time did you stand up there and say, I am Jesus, I am here to lead you to the better... Do you, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're not showing it, which I found quite surprising having... Heard all the other things. Heard thing. the other stuff. Yeah. I just wanted to really just touch on that. All mm. right, yeah, so... Um, it's where you're thinking about the seven story, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and other things that I've read was... Um, all right, yeah. I, I, Almost I everything you've read. That, that something about that, because I sure. think we need to... And, and also, so what are you trying to um, convey to the people that come to your seminar? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah sure. Two, really. All right, okay. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I, if, if it's just two questions, I'll make it, but I'm first in line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I promise. <laughs> two, and then when you're in the loo, I'll ask a few more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that's the thing. I you can go if you want. Days, um, at the conference. At and the and it, it's, it's going to form part of, a big part sure. of the story, yeah. yeah. Sure. So, do, you, sure. do you want me to? I can just go. And, well, like, it would be good for you to. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah hang on there. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Sounds like I posted. Hopefully she's not coming in. Okay, we're rolling. So if you remember being Jesus in the first century and you're back again, why don't you make a bigger deal of it at your seminars? <laughs> well, as you saw at the seminar, I, you know, I very rarely say, look, I'm Jesus and you have to listen to me. In fact, I've never said that. In fact, I feel quite strongly that, that people need to be given the chance to be given information and, and feel about it and think about it for themselves. And, and they can then work out what the truth is through their own experience, I feel. So I never make a big song and dance about, no, I'm Jesus and you should listen to me. And, and in fact, I don't, the reason why I don't do that is because I don't believe that. I don't believe that people should just listen to me because I'm Jesus. That's like saying that, you know, whoever you are, they should listen to you because you're that person. It doesn't make any logical sense to me. If, if, if anyone's going to listen, they need to listen because it makes sense, because it appeals to their heart, because they want to become more loving and they want to have a relationship with God and they want to discover more about those particular issues that I'm speaking of. Listen then, and only listen then. Don't listen because Mary is saying she's Mary Magdalene and I'm saying I'm Jesus. Listen to what we're saying rather than just listen to the claim. And I feel the only reason why I'm claiming I'm Jesus is because I am Jesus. Like, that's the only reason. I, I don't have any other uh, hidden agenda based around, <laughs> around it. I, I just am being honest about who I am, that's all. And, and I knew that I'd have to be honest about who I was if I was ever going to teach anything about truth. Because how, how can I teach people to be or live in harmony with truth when I myself would be covering over the truth of who I am. That, that wouldn't be very ethically sound. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things we notice is that quite a lot of people tear up in, in your, they get very emotional in, in listening to what you, your message. Mm -hmm. why, why is that? You want to answer that one? Sure, sure. <laughs> I feel that it, it touches their heart, you know. Uh, I feel that a lot of what we're saying um, resonates with them about experiences that they've had in their life or perhaps they receive a feeling of being accepted that they haven't experienced as much before in their life. I also, because we teach a lot about the importance of being yourself and being truthful and a part of that 
is being truthful about what you feel. In fact, the, the majority of who you are is what you feel. Um, so we have a very open attitude towards people experiencing their emotions. Do you attract people who want to experience their emotions? That, 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 that's the sort of person that comes to you because they have yeah. pain of some sort? Sometimes I wish that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of our audiences have been very intellectual, very intellectually yeah. focused. and. And it's very difficult getting, out of their, getting them out of their stoicism, their personal stoicism, where they've shut down almost every emotional experience and they're just looking at everything intellectually. And it's quite difficult moving them from that place or helping them move from that place where they can at least start to feel themselves and feel what they really feel. And so we do have a, a, an interesting time Is with it, audiences. Yeah. The audience you saw this weekend have, have listened to us for, many of them have listened to us for many years now, for, for three, four or five years. And as a result, many of them have now started to connect emotionally to how they feel. But when we first met them, man, it was like talking yeah. to brick walls sometimes, you know. <laughs> Took a while to get the train out of the station. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've spoken to the three Kiwis that, you know, there's probably more Kiwis in your, in your yeah. group, but we've spoken to three and they certainly didn't have any trouble accessing their emotions and they've had some quite horrific things happened to them in their childhood, mm. particularly around um, schooling and beating and whatever, yeah, you know. Is yeah. that really common? No, it's not common. Um, we, we sort of get a real mixture of people come along to our seminars. There's, there's people who've had really horrific childhoods that you see come along, but then there's people who are very, like, had what you would classify as a, a, a Almost upper privileged, class, privileged yeah. existence. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, who also come along and then there's a wide range of people in between. There's also a wide range of uh, intellectual capacity and also um, uh, educational uh, backgrounds as, long, as well as cultures obviously where we get right from you know PhDs, people with PhDs right the way through to people who have not had any education at all um, attending our seminars around the world. So there's a very wide variety and the media in the past has tried to focus in on some certain ones or, in, in, you know, they find somebody who has that problem and, and they've tried to expose, expose that. But the reality is, if you, if you look at the entire group together, you know, there's doctors, there's lawyers, there's scientists, there's, and there's also people who, you know, just a, fam a normal family, what you'd classify as a normal family here in Australia. Um, and, and overseas, it's a wide variety as well. So one yeah, of the criticisms yeah. in, the, in the seven piece was that you're sucking people into a vortex of grief, you know, yeah, that where, they, David, where David. they need to yeah. express their uh, anger and their pain. Uh, not necessarily <laughs> true. No, I, I do believe that it does us good and we grow when we allow the emotions that we've suppressed inside of us. In fact, it's an essential part of connecting to anybody. If, if I'm holding on to emotions of the past about men, for example, it's going to be, I'm going to be very mistrustful of you as a man. So unless I somehow release these emotions of the past so they do not interfere with my relationship with you, you and I can't have a very good relationship. And now, if I have a relationship with a woman and I've got stuff that I'm holding on to about my mother and, and other women that I've had, relationships that I've had, I've got anger, then sooner or later that anger with women is going to come out towards the, the other party. So sooner or later we have to address these particular emotions if we're truly going to have any loving relationships. But, but we don't feel that... Uh, we suck people into a vortex of, of misery. Certainly what we're not a downward to, spiral. Yeah, we see it as an upward, a, spiral, an upward spiral. Yeah. <laughs> Where you become happier and happier as you release all of these particular yeah. things. Yeah. How are you with the Jews then? With, in, in what way? Well, as in the first century. The people that sort of it, it puts you on the cross. You all, know? all of my friends were Jews in the first right. century, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. like Mary's we're a Jew. Jew. Oh, <laughs> so how do yeah. I feel about? Well, I feel about Jews exactly the same way as I feel about every single other person on this planet. I love people dearly. I just feel that we are all part of. We are all children of God. Mm -hmm. We, we all have this beautiful ability to love, while at the same time we have this terrible. Every time we hold on to negative emotions, we have this terrible effect of going into rage and anger and violence. So we have these capacities, if you like, as a human soul into huge negative and also hugely positive directions. And, and what I would love to see is humanity choose in a more active way, the more positive loving directions in our, in our life. And I've seen people who are murderers, 
change. You know, many of my acquaintances in the first century were murderers. Um, you know, they would, many of my acquaintances in the first century were classified, would be classified now as terrorists, in fact. Um, you know, some of them were purposefully terrorists as well, you know, until I met them and they changed. People change, can change, and particularly with God's love entering their soul, they can change. And, and this is what we'd like to teach people is they can change. They can, they can not, not through a hard, laborious method of, you know, having to work on every single personal issue, but rather by the, having this experience with God and receiving divine love, which actually helps the soul change. And, and the soul softens and the soul becomes more loving and you automatically start expressing this more loving nature. And I feel if, if the majority of religions, religions on the planet just incorporated that one teaching into their doctrine, we would instantly have no religion fighting any other religion. And that would be a wonderful thing on this mm. planet to have no religious violence at all uh, in any direction. And no one religion would ever back up a government going to war. Now, if, imagine in that, if that happened, we'd have 84% of the population, I think that's how many are claimed to be religious at this point in time, we'd have 84% of the population all of a sudden no longer being willing to go to war no longer being willing to have acts of violence perpetrated towards others. And I, I just feel that's, that's the primary thing we want to get across, that there is a way for the heart to change so that you don't feel drawn into that kind of action. Mm. And, and I feel yeah. that's what we're trying to get across at our seminars. That's the main purpose of our seminars, as you saw over the weekend, just helping people have some faith that love is possible. Because we feel today on the planet there's a lot of lack of belief in love. Like, uh, people believe love is weak, it doesn't have any strength, it doesn't have any power to change things. And I, I believe completely different to that and always have. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. You can go. We've got to get a few more. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. If I just get oh, you guys to take that off. Can get the off you. Oh, I'll just get this one too. Yeah. There we go.